I'm coming from a family. Seven children, three sisters, four brothers, and my parents. We live an average life, a very religious life. My father, he was an Orthodox Jew. And I went to Haida, I went to Polish school. And I learned a trade. What I remember from my childhood was a small family, not very wealthy. We all lived in, in a neighborhood which later was the ghetto. My father was a printer, had a printer's shop and worked there with a helper. My mother was a housewife. We were two children. We used to walk to school quite a long time. It took an hour, perhaps, and on foot. We met children together, so we did not walk alone and um, talked and recited and studied poetry on the way, so it was sort of nice. We had nine children. Uh, we had, you know, five brothers and four sisters. We are right now over here, three, two brothers and one sister. We had also two nephews and a grandfather in our house, and we remain only three of us from all of them. All of them went. Living in Chestachau, we had a shop from tailoring. My father was a tailor. We all children worked in the shop, in the tailoring. We had a wonderful time as kids. We are, we played, we belonged to Zionist organization, we played ping pong, football, anything what we had was a wonderful time. I personally live a social and good life. I would say the average life. Because in my time, that time, I had a good trade. And I was making, making fair money. So that time, if you had enough to feed yourself mm -hmm. and to buy for yourself nice clothes, and once a week, if you was able to go to a movie with your girlfriend, that was a luxury. I personally ask, uh, uh, you know, a kid over there, something like that, how come, you know, you don't play, it isn't that? Well, he said, you were Jewish. I said, what's the difference? So he said, you kill Christ. I said, what, the, how, I didn't understand, you know, but, uh, you know, the, he said, you killed Christ. I said, I didn't kill him. What do you want from me? He said, you killed him. So that was uh, very, the, the religion, you know, was, uh, got uh, a lot of things to do in, in the school. In the city, we had three miles away from, from where we lived over there, we had the Holy Shrine over there. In Częstochow, in Polish they say Częstochowa, that was the biggest church, whoever you talk to, and if, then he's going to tell you the same thing, and Częstochow was the biggest anti-Semitic city. I make so much money, you know, I was working two shifts and I was both shifts in the, in the factory and I was working. And I had two children. Really, I had a better life beside money. I mean, money was no question. It's like, uh, so uh, this better life was this, was one child was retarded. In 1933, we had been married and uh, we had a child in 1937, a girl, and uh, I was a very successful businessman. My father knew the politics. He was all his life in this. So I heard him when I was a child for 19, I was born in 1924, I mean 1928. I was a little child, five years, six years, I always heard Whole nights he used to stay at the radio and hear all his speeches. At that time, I didn't understand who's, who was speaking, you know. But later, I found out. He knew it is going to be something. 
or we didn't uh, we didn't understand too much, you know, what's going on. You see, we didn't know. Even they said, you know, Hitler in Palestine, you're going to go to Palestine, you're going to get Hitler's coming or something like that. You kill Christ. We didn't, uh, you know, we didn't know nothing. As uh, you know, I, I didn't know it was, you know, it's going to be so bad. See, we wasn't organized. See, nobody told nothing. You know, even even you want to go away, the father didn't want to let you. You didn't want to leave your father and mother. You stood with the family all together, you know. We wasn't trained to have a gun. We wasn't trained to have a knife. We wasn't trained, you know, for this kind of business over there. You know, stay away from us, stay away. Stay away, stay away. We did, we wasn't nothing, you know. We just worked, you know, went to school and went to the Polish school. We went to Hebrew school and, uh, and go home and work in the house. I was in the street, and one day, bombs come down. So everybody started to go back to the houses and around. It was already that time a lot of people killed. And we hide it, so it didn't took too long. In 39, when uh, Germans took over Czestochowa after a very, very short fight, during that time, we ran, my family and I, I remember hiding in a cellar, probably when they bombarded the city, and hiding from the Germans. From Czestochow to the, to the border, from, from German border, was only 25 miles. You know, we was only not too far away from, from them over there. That's why they was in, in 1939, they started Friday, in Sunday, 10 o'clock, they was already in the city. It could be they was there at night. I didn't see it because at night I was sleeping. Oh, but that day, Saturday, I walked out and I, I see them fighting. In Sunday morning, when I walked out, over there, it was 10 o'clock, I took a walk. Three miles up to the city hall over there. It was three miles from my house to the city hall over there. I took a walk over there. We see the Germans was already all over occupied the city. It was a friend of my father. And I walked out over there, I went in over there. His son was a friend of mine over there, and you know, we, I know that. Also a tailor, his name was Mr. Blitz. And he said to me, now it's time to kill ourselves, that man. And I looked at him, I didn't know what he was talking about. And, uh, and I went up to the city hall, and I went away. I asked the son if he wants to go for a walk. He said, no, so I went myself. I went up three miles over there, and I saw the Germans and all the city hall, I wanted to see. They put the German flag up and everything like that. I see the whole story. And after when I walked back, I walked back and at the, in the evening I went again over there and he was killed already. He, oh, he threw him that Mr. Blitz. So he went up on the third floor and he threw himself down and he killed himself. The next morning, all the people, they tell us with the bayonets over there and everything. We lost the Bloody Monday, they call it Bloody Monday. We lost at the Bloody Monday 300 to 400 people. They just rouse, rouse, out, 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 with the bayonet and everything, out, out, and out, and then they had it, they, they, they show you the way to go to the, to the green over there. All the bayonet was open with the guns and everything like that. Just like that, with the bayonet, they was going and all that thing about it. This was the blood Monday. They started right in the morning. And this was our first day, the first, I mean, the first day of the bloody Monday over there. They ordered a whole Jewish population of that city to get to certain points, gathered, and when that happened, they picked at random just every so on and just shot them. People there, and I was in the barracks, where there were quite a few thousand people. And then we just had been released to go home. And since then, we knew what uh, to expect. Every day, another branch of the German troops, or the gendarmes, or Gestapo, or for the city hall, have been picking up people in the street at random, whatever they could to do their work. 
uh, the first of all, they throw out the Jews, the rich Jews, from the houses. They took away everything. They put us between three, five families in a two in a two uh, bedroom apartment. So I saw it's very bad. My father's printer shop was closed. The Germans took over the machinery. Uh, my school was closed. So our teachers decided to continue education in their homes. So I remember we walked in small groups to their homes for further instructions. Then slowly one teacher disappeared. We didn't know where. Our doctors disappeared. We didn't know where. It was all hushed, maybe because I was a child then. But maybe also people really didn't know. It was very gradually done. There were rumors that they were taken to another city to work, or they were needed because intelligentsia, as we call it, intelligentsia, were slowly disappearing from the city. Doctors, professors, teachers, directors slowly disappeared. So they were the first to go. Um, after a while, we did not study at all. When they got to work, people to work, any kind of work, not to work what is productive, productive, only, you know, to keep Jews hard working. So I said, I'm a mechanic, and I want to do, I can do any kind of work. So they took me to work. What they gave me, I did. I, st I tried to do the best, I mean the best as a mechanic, not the best for them as a mechanic to show to be needed, to can uh, keep the, for the children and for the house. Soon they, claw, they create the ghetto, six or seven months later, when they came into Chester, because this was only 30 or 40 miles from the German border. Then we start to feel how difficult it is to get food, to get the first aid, and a Jew was not allowed to leave the ghetto. We had some rationing from the Jewish, they, they create a Jewish administration. And I would say, used to get 900 or 1,000 calories for each head. That was in the beginning. Later was even not less than that. And Between young people had to go and to work for the Germans. The Jewish administration used to point out who has to go to work. We had no money to leave for, because jobs were not available. Mm -hmm. So we struggle. Mm -hmm. I used to go out of my, out, I mean, out of the ghetto. I took off my armband and asking my, my father's friend for help. Mm -hmm. That's the only way we survived, just, you know, uh, just whatever we could. It was very hard. Begging people, please help me. We did have some nice people who my father, rest in peace, used to help them too. And they gave me, I was carrying on my shoulder, we call it the rucksack. It's not, the, it's a, what do you call that, a, in the back you carry stuff? A backpack. Yeah, backpack. And uh, I was, had potatoes. Mm -hmm. following day after Yom Kippur, they surrounded us and put us on a big market. 
left and right, young ones even too. We're just plain lucky that we got them on this side. My sister and my mother were separated. The girl and, and I was screaming. I said, Mama, I was crying. And one of the who surrounded us was a Jewish guy who helped, who had to help. And he said, you be happy because you're going to work. And he shot me up. And I said, like somebody said, your life is going to be saved. And I said, Mama. And I screamed. So he shot me up. I said, don't scream. So I was separated with my sisters, two sisters. And uh, this was the end. Before we knew it, there was a very harsh knock on the door. The door burst open. Assessment came in with rifles. Out, 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 in German. And we were forced out. We, I never saw my home anymore after that. Uh, we were taken out into the street very fast, very loud. Uh, I probably was shocked. I didn't know what's happening. But still, I had my mother, my father, another girl, young girl who lived with us, who had my mother. Uh, also was taken, and they arranged this quickly with rifles in fives, and five, and five, and five, and all my neighbors were coming out of their houses and uh, apartments, and fives, and fives, and fives were arranged that way, and marched forward. And we came to a certain spot where the Germans separated people, and because the five people were always members of the family, they knew exactly what they were doing. They separated the families. So first, my mother was separated, of course, with, with, the, with a gun uh, pointing to left, right, left, right. My mother and the girl who worked with her were to one side. My father and my brother and I to the other side. At that point, my father wanted to run to my mother to go with her. Well, they hit him with a gun and not killed him, just hit him, pushed him away, and he went back to us. Mother disappeared. I didn't know then where she went. Le later I found out that it was the first transport to Tremblinka. So she was lost to us. We did not know where she went. My father and I and my brothers remained together for a while. The Germans sent my brother and my father to work on a railroad track. They sent us to work somewhere else. Every day we returned to the same place where they stationed us. And one day my father and brother did not return. Again, I didn't know at that time what happened to them. Later, I found out from witnesses that they were both shot on the railroad in the back. Uh, at that time, I didn't know. But from that moment when I was left alone with other Jews who were left alone, without any links to the family, and I was barely 15 then. Every day, a certain part of the city has to be gathered in a certain place. Uh, where they have decided which one has to go right and left between dead or to be alive. It was Hasak, Hugo Schneider Aktiengesellschaft, it was called. It was a labor camp in Częstochowa, somewhere on the outskirts of the city. And what we did was we, they were bringing shells from anti-aircraft guns or ammunition. And the shells that were destroyed or partially destroyed or bent were restored in that factory. Now I have a wife and a kid still in the ghetto, which hasn't been touched yet. He knew I have a sick child. He said, by us in Germany, we are not keeping people like this. We are gi giving the, uh, the injection because the, 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 the country has not a use for such a people. If it would be my son, I would do the same. He advised me. We went with Germans over the inside in that hassock or whatever. We come in over there. The first thing, they lined us up, all 300 people. and. We went up one flight. There was one huge room for the 300 people. It was 300 people, 150 day on one side and one 150 day on the other side. 
was only one bathroom there, and that's the way we was inside. And this was the first day with other parents. The first cry out, and that night we was choking and crying. I was 15, and I was one of the youngest in camp. All younger children were killed and murdered. And, uh... You have to understand one thing. The children two years old, overnight they became thousand years old. They knew like rats that they will be killed. I told you the first child was I have the sick child. When they liquidated the ghetto, they took a truck. And with the truck, they took people with the children. Before I came into the, my apartment, the policeman told me, it was here a truck, and they took a man went up, I mean from the civil Jews. They went up, he brought a, a sleeping child down. And this was the end from this child. They start to build a small ghetto from all these people who were left in the factory. In order to do that, they have picked women. And they marched with them to that small place where Jewish people used to live and to clean up. And they were going about 10, 12 in a row, the women with uh, pails and uh, everything which is needed to clean up, rashes. My wife took the child and put in one of these pails and go in. Within 10 or 12 in a row, they went into that little place where the ghetto will be. Now going back, she hid the kid under a bed in that little ghetto. Overnight, the kid was by herself. Until the next day, she came back again and gave her some to eat. This was for a few days. And in the end, they took all of the rest and put in that ghetto. And all these people who were sent to factories to work had to go back every day into that new ghetto. Now here again, we had the whole family together. We had one night we went home, was uh, Two, two guys uh, fall asleep in, 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 in the place. And we was counted to, uh, 200 in, in 90, 98. And we took one guy out because every 50, they had responsible one guy. And they took out the guy, you know, and they shot him because he didn't know where the two guys was at. And next day, the two guys, you know, was there in the, fab, in the, in the factory. Nothing would happen to them. Over there. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it was something, you know, this everything where I saw it, you know. It was a young boy, the same thing, you know. He was a cap maker. I know him very good. I, I see him every day. I mean, I see him in my, my, my dream. I can see him because we all work together. So fortunate that we were working where the Pope was, where the Holy Madonna, the Black Madonna is. And we got in touch going back and forth, you know, painting, you just, people go back and forth. With one of the sisters and we told them the story, we wanna just save our kid, how to do it. And we gave them an address and the name of our former mate. Well, whatever they arranged, that the mate will be at a certain time at that place and the kid will just walk out. And so happened, she took the child and walked with the child up to the post office. Over there was another woman. They didn't know each other who took over the child. And that woman brought the child into that monastery to a closed door and she has to leave. There can't be no witnesses. Then the door opened they took in the child. The child came in. They have listed as an orphan 
of a Polish officer. The other child, when I, the last, the second place I took away, so I saw I be killed because they always were joking, next day, next day, finish, you know. So I saw, and I had a connection in the, uh, from the underground, was an engineer electric in Hasak. He was living outside, he was in the underground, and he has the job as, as electric engineer in Hasak, in the concentration camp where the metal factory was, you know. So I saw, maybe in a, in a day, they will keep, keep me in the, they will not let me out. So I have to, I have to, to give the child, the person, what I can have a connection with him. So I ask him, I give you the, so much, so much money to keep my child with your child, you know. And he agreed. And I trust him because he was an underground. We were extremely hungry all the time. We were getting uh, a piece of bread, maybe that big, dry bread for the whole day. So some of us could resist and take a little bit in the morning, a little bit in noontime, a little bit in the evening, but most of us ate it right away in the morning. And for lunch, we got some potato peel soup, water and potato peels. For the evening, there was some Erzatz cafe, some coffee. And that was what, what we lived on three years. As far as I'm concerned, I didn't even hope for being saved. We just knew that someday we will die just like everybody else. We looked out to the windows. We saw, my God, fights. The Russian woman, they came, they had a whole battalion and they came and they fought those Germans. And they were, oh, I saw so much death again. And all of a sudden, a young Jewish man ran into the hall, opened the doors, and told us, come out, come out, we are free. The Russians are here, the Germans are running away. Being in, in camps, being in concentrate, we were just fighting for the every day. Mm -hmm. We never knew. We were always expect that any day is going to happen something. But after we were liberated, we're set because where are you going to go? Where are you going? No, where is home? I went back to Częstochowa, and yet I want to pick up my child. I know she's in that monastery, but how are you going to pick it up? She's there as an orphan. So my wife and I went there. And we start uh, talking to the nuns. They didn't believe it. She has no parents. She's a devoted kid to Jesus Christ, to the church. Well, we uh, just couldn't let it go by that. We called in uh, one monk and another monk, and then came the head men, and uh, we tried to converse them, that this is our child. But then they came up with a verdict. Let the child make her own choice. She was walking from one end to the other, back and forth. She didn't know what to do, and finally she probably recognized me and got to me crying, I want to go with you. So one day, I, the, the, from the underground, the, the, the people, the, the folks people, you know, there's nothing. So they, they saw me in the street, come with us, we're going to drink now. So I, I be, you know, a party from the underground. I said, I can't go, I have to look for my child. And I can't trust no more the, for the underground, I don't know where is my child. So he, he told me, listen, one, you have to know, go there and there, you, you'll hear everything what happened. 
and there was a lake, and I went there, and I asked the neighbors around, I knocked in the house, so a woman told me, when the Germans were here, somebody brought the child, was crying, they was waiting, we went out from the lake, in the, mon in the morning we found a dead child, and then we saw the, we told the Germans, he said, that child in the water. And I didn't want to tell this my wife. What will help? I had this in me. This is me, and this is my friend who had that picture. She survived with her father from the same city. We were just neighbors and very close friends. And this Helen and I are only survivors. All these children, these girls, were killed during the first action. They were just, as they took people out, five and five, they went, they went to death and we went to life, life. We were a family for 96 people. Uncles, aunts, cousins, grandfathers, and I'm the only one I'm still around. People wonder why we never smile, we never laugh. This part of our brain is dead. We don't know what it was. My child, my daughter, never laughs. She's now a grown, wonderful person. She lives in Los Angeles, California. And uh, I have a son who lives in Atlanta, Georgia, who's married. He went through law school, so was my daughter. But the difference between that child's life and my son is in two worlds. I was just like coming back from grave, dead, without feeling. Here people live normally playing the piano, having mates, good times, they laugh, and here we are deaf. <laughs> 